let's now think through what's going on with electric potential when we have conductors. And note that these are going to be conductors in electrostatic equilibrium. That means that they might be polarized or they might have a net surface charge. However, they don't have any charges that are actively in motion. And remember, the reason we get to say this is because if all of our charges are stationary, we know that the force on all of our charges is equal to zero. So if the forces on our charges are equal to zero, the electric field everywhere in the conductor must be zero. So electrostatic equilibrium gives us this condition on forces, which then gives us this condition on the electric field. So now from this, we come to the conclusion that the potential difference between any two points inside of our conductor is zero. And note that I might actually have a potential at my surface. Maybe my surface is at 100 volts, and keep in mind that that would be with respect to infinity. But then if I have two points inside my conductor, we do our path integral to get from electric field to potential. And we see that if I'm integrating zero, I get zero. So that means that this point is at 100 volts, and that this point is at 100 volts. So again, keep in mind that this doesn't mean that the potential everywhere is zero, but the change in potential is zero. So what that means is that anywhere within your conductor where the electric field is zero, you have the same potential as the surface. Now note that if I have a bubble and there's still no electric field inside that bubble, well then these points all have 100 volts of potential as well. If, on the other hand, there is a charge in here such that there is electric field, well, then you would actually have a change. So when electric field is zero, then you have no change in potential. So hopefully that makes sense. Again, if not, you might have to go back and review the relationship between electric field and potential. And remember that here we're talking about the change in electric potential, which is the most interesting quantity such, since we can always set zero to wherever we want, though typically the choices that we're setting at infinity uh, are potential to be zero. So now what about the fields outside of a conductor? And there's a few things that we can now understand based on the rules regarding potential. So we know that all of our excess charge is on the surface. And we already knew that because we said that uh, they're spreading out and otherwise you would actually be having electric fields on the, on the inside. So all of our surface charge is exactly on the surface. And you can think about Gauss's law that if I draw a surface here and I say that there's no net in charge enclosed, then I know my flux is zero and that's going to be true if my electric field is zero. So we can use Gauss's law to think about this. The surface is an equipotential. Why would that be? Well, we said that there's no potential difference between any points in the conductor itself. So therefore, if this point is 100 volts, then a point somewhere else on the conductor must also be 100 volts. So the surface is an equipotential. And so we've already said three and four, those are coming from the previous slides. But now here's what's a little bit interesting. If the surface is an equipotential itself, and we said before that when you have an equipotential, that your electric field is perpendicular to the surface everywhere. So what that means is that our electric field must actually be perpendicular to our surface. So everywhere we have an electric field perpendicular to the surface and we're actually going to have a different magnitude of electric field at corners right? So in this region, we clearly have something that if you were really, really close to it would look just like an infinite plane. But as you get close to something over here, it starts to actually look like a cylinder, a sphere, if you were closer, or a cylinder, depending on the cross-section of this. If you were really, really close, it would be like a plane. But having these different curvatures actually means that your potential here, how your um, equipotential surface looks, is a little bit different. Instead of here, we would have these nice 
flat equipotentials here, we have these curvy um, equipotentials. So we have a bigger electric field strength. So this is something to think about, that our electric field is actually not going to be the same strength everywhere outside of this. And you can think about this as also being related to a slightly different uh, surface charge density. And again, that comes back to the notion that our electric, um, that our equipotentials have to be the same. So there's kind of a weird relationship here. We're going to mostly just be talking about it here conceptually. So please study this picture. It's really helpful. And now let's talk about some applications of how we can think about this. So one is the idea of corona discharge. Let's say that this metal tip here is at 1,000 volts. And that's going to be relative to ground, which is something we'll learn about uh, pretty soon. This is the same as one kilovolt. So that's a pretty high voltage. But the question of whether or not air is breaking down such that we get a spark, as you've seen with the Wimshurst machine, well, that's going to be a question of the electric field, that the electric field strength determines whether or not there's a spark. So even though the potential is the same everywhere, this sharp corner gives you a really high electric field right at the very tip. So the electric field strength is very high here, and it's much lower in this region. So what that means is you actually have a strong enough electric field here to create a spark and break down the air. So we would say that this sphere here is actually at ground. So we're getting a discharge between this really sharp point and this sphere. This is actually one of the reasons why you'll see that a lot of what we talk about in electrostatics are spheres. Because if we want to talk about electric fields in a reasonable way, if we want to think about uh, symmetry, we really need to have none of these sharp corners. So just our experimental apparatus, when we want to make sure that there's not a bunch of sparks, we try to make sure that there are no sharp corners. If we want to see this discharge, well, then we do actually have some sharp corners. Um, but like in the lab, when you're working with high voltages, you make sure everything is, is nice and rounded. So this is an interesting phenomena that you can witness. And again, sharp points means that's where your sparks come from. So the second thing we can start to do is actually estimating the shapes of our fields and our equipotentials when we have multiple objects that are extended. So in this case, I have a sphere, and here I have a flat plane. The sphere is at 0 volts, and the flat plane is at 50. Now, obviously, if the sphere is at 0 volts, that means our uh, at infinity. We don't necessarily have 0 volts, but we don't need to worry about it. We're just worrying about these. So the first thing we can do is think about our equipotentials. We know that the equipotentials around this plane are going to look more or less plane-like, like a box. However, corners get rounded off fairly quickly. We don't have a lot of corners in our equipotentials. And so this first one we draw here, which is actually at 40 volts, is like a pill-shaped, right? You, you've lost that short, sharp corner. But then remember that equipotentials must be equally spaced. So if this is 50 and that's 0, we have one at 10, 20, 30, 40. So when I come over to the sphere, my first one's going to look very similar to a circle at 10 volts. It shifted a little bit to account for the fact that you don't have a perfect symmetry. We do have something at high voltage over here. So you expect that, well, higher voltage. So you expect that you have more field lines between them than you do over here, just heading off to infinity. So that circle shifted a little bit. Well then, your next two field lines are just really kind of moving you from the circle shape back over here. And you can see that this one would be, I'm not very good at drawing, like that. And then this one would probably be something like that. So that's how we can start to estimate the equipotentials. Then, in this case, we're drawing field lines coming away from the higher potential object towards the lower potential object and making sure that they're perpendicular at every point on the equipotential. Previously, we talked about drawing field vectors. Here, we're actually drawing uh, field lines. But again, your field lines need to be perpendicular, and you want to actually have the, um, the strength has to do with the spacing of, uh, of your equipotentials. And so that's where 
you would be able to estimate a little bit about how they're bending away versus bending towards. Notice that these are more distant than these, so you expect to have more field lines in this area than you do over there.